There are two important ways to coordinate process flows in distributed applications. The first is using an event-driven architecture, and the second is using a workflow. The purpose of this video is to inform you about what these two types of architectures are, how they can be built using AWS, and the pros and cons of using one approach over the other. So let's get into it. All right, so I wanted to use a e-commerce example to explain to you the difference between these two application architectures. So bear with me for a couple moments while I explain to you what's going on here. So let's assume that we have four core stages in this application workflow. The first step involves you, the user, placing the order with some kind of e-commerce retailer. From there, the online retailer needs to communicate with the warehouse to receive that order and maybe dispatch a warehouse worker to pack package that order up. Once that order is successfully packaged, it's then ready to go. Before we can send it out to our customer, we need to first charge that customer by invoking a API in a third party service that's responsible for billing the customer. Once that's all done, we can move to shipping the package out to the customer by putting that package on a truck and getting a driver to go and deliver it. So how would we build a system that roughly models these four sequences of steps using an event-driven application architecture? So let's look at that now. All right, so now with AWS services. So of course, again, it starts with us as the user, but I wanted to draw out the bounding boxes of those four steps, the placing of the order, the packaging of the order, the charging of the customer, and the shipping of the package. These are kind of steps in our workflow that we need to logically move through to complete an order flow process. So keep that in the back of your mind. So what are the AWS services that we may use to build this kind of thing? Well, first we start with API Gateway. We're gonna have a customer that's invoking an endpoint to place an order. That's going to trigger an, a serverless Lambda function, which is going to save the state of that order, maybe create a new entry in a DynamoDB table. That DynamoDB table may trigger another Lambda function as a result of change events, and it's going to broadcast the fact that an order was placed out to other services that may want to listen using an SNS topic. We're done so far with the placing of the order. Then we have a second suite of services that are responsible for packaging that order. So again, we have another Lambda function that's invoked by that SNS topic. We are going to take advantage of the IoT service or Internet of Things service to broadcast a message out to a warehouse worker that's instructed to pick and pack a package. And then once that's complete, we are going to again broadcast a message out to an SNS topic so that we can proceed to the next step. So packaging of the order is now complete. Next, we need to move to the part where we actually charge the customer. So again, we're going to have another Lambda function here. This function is going to be responsible for communicating with a third party service. I'm just calling this a credit card service in this case. And then once we're successful upon calling that service, we can save the state of that charge into a database so we don't duplicate it. And at least we have a record of it before moving on to the final step, which is the shipping of the package. We can trigger a Lambda function as a result of that DynamoDB insert event, and that Lambda function is responsible for the shipping of the package. So that function is going to call again an IoT-based service to broadcast a message out to instruct a delivery driver to pick up a package and deliver it to a particular address. So this is a event-driven application that roughly models those four steps that we wanted to move through in this e-commerce application. And again, this may not technically be the most correct way of doing it, but it gives you kind of a good idea of the core steps that you may need to work through. So what are the advantages or what are the good things about using this type of architecture? So the first one has to do with decentralization. And what I mean by that is that we don't have any central authority that is is kind of keeping an eye on an order flow process. The order flow is just kind of passing through this implicit workflow that we've created. And that workflow is constructed through the wiring together of these different infrastructure services. So we don't have any particular authority that is kind of saying, okay, do the first step, now do the next step, now do the next step, now do the final step. It's just kind of implicit. And the linking of these different services is what defines the workflow itself. In addition to that, if you are in a service-oriented architecture or organizational environment, it's very easy to carve out certain pieces of this infrastructure and hand that piece of infrastructure off to a particular team. For example, you can have a team that's responsible for the infrastructure just for the placement of the orders, and that's all that they care about. You can have another team that's responsible for packaging of the orders. They know how to communicate with warehouse services, how to broadcast events to uh, folks in the warehouse 
warehouse to pick up and package orders. You have another team that's responsible for saving the state of charging customers and communicating with these third-party credit card services. And then finally, you have a kind of a logistics or a transportation team that's responsible for shipping the package, making sure we have enough drivers, communicating with the drivers, and monitoring it while it's out on road. So if you really wanted to, you can separate this out into four different teams using a service-oriented architecture approach and have those teams kind of operate independently. And another benefit is the fact that you have great performance here. So you don't have any centralized coordinator that's kind of moving this workflow between these different steps. You're just using low level AWS services like SNS and triggering Lambda functions or SNS and SQS queues. So you're gonna have optimal performance here and not have the overhead of having to use any kind of centralized orchestrator. So those are some of the pros of using this type of architecture. But what about the cons? Now the main one that stands out for me is in terms of monitoring. So think about this question for a second. Say an order got placed earlier in the day. With this architecture, how do you know where the order is in this implicit workflow that we created? How do you know what step it's on? Well, sure, you have like a database that's stored over here. So I suppose you can check out this database to see that it's been saved here. You have another one that's over here. So maybe you can check out this one to see what's going on here. But what if the order is currently at this step here in the packaging phase? You're kind of in between here. So you can see it's not very clear what the state of this order is. It requires looking through all these different services, understanding how they're wired together, and then kind of figuring out where it may be by looking at a number of databases not the most ideal. Now, another big problem is in terms of failure handling. So say, for example, we run through this workflow and you know we, we place the order, we package the order, we get to this step here where we want to charge the customer. We try to charge the customer and then we fail. Maybe the customer's credit card is canceled or there's a, a notification or a limit on it or something like that, and we're not able to do that. We now need to kind of unwind all of the things that we did in the previous sequence of events that took place in this workflow. Now, there's not really a huge problem with that, but typically what these type of applications do is, you know, you emit some kind of failure event here and these other services uh, have hooks into that event and they kind of self-heal themselves. But you can see here, like there's extra work that needs to be done there. It's not just given for free and you need to build additional logic and use additional infrastructure to build that process out to handle failure scenarios. So that's how we can build this using a event-driven architecture. And sometimes you'll hear this type of architecture called choreography. And why is it called choreography? If you think about what the word choreography means, it's typically used in the context of dances. And in dances, people are moving independently in a sequence of patterns that's predefined and they're moving in sequence. And you can see here in this application architecture, we have a choreography as well. We have the linking of services through infrastructure that is defining a sequence of events and each component has a specific role where it knows what to do. So that's why we have a choreography. Now what I wanna do is talk about how we model this same kind of application using a workflow style architecture. So let's move over there. All right, so what I have in front of you here is a workflow that I built using AWS step functions that models pretty much that exact same event-driven application, but this time using that workflow style approach. Now, if you've never heard about step functions before, I have a whole video on what they are and why they're useful. But the main summary is, is that in a step function workflow, you have a sequence of steps that this workflow transitions through. So as you can see, every box here is a step that we've created in this flow. And behind the scenes, you have this kind of orchestrator over here that is keeping tabs on the status of every single step here. And it knows kind of what to do in each particular step and what it needs to do next after that step has either been completed or failed. And the neat part about this is that it's very easy to drag and drop steps into this studio style editor here. So you can very quickly build out these pretty comprehensive workflows. So let's walk through the steps of that event-driven application as it is built in this particular workflow. So the first step here is to place that order through an API gateway endpoint. And if you recall, one of the first things we need to do is to save that state of that order into our DynamoDB table. So this step here, these two steps, these are the first flow of our workflow. So the placing of the order. 
Next, we can move on to notifying our warehouse worker. So we use a Lambda function that's invoked after that put item request has been completed in our DynamoDB table. We then send the data to the wireless device, which is going to be a warehouse worker that's going to pick and package that order. We're going to wait for a period of time and we're going to either hear task success or task timeout. And you can see where this starts to get pretty cool because now we can have different branches of logic that gets implemented whether or not we have something like a timeout or whether or not we have a success. So we can introduce this explicit branching logic directly into our workflow. So again, if we draw these kind of bounding boxes over the different sequences of the steps here, everything kind of what I'm drawing around here is our next step, which was the packaging of the order. All right, so let's move on to the third step now, which was the charging of the customer. And you can see that's what we do in the success case, whereas the timeout case, if we scroll down a little bit here, that just results in a workflow failure or workflow cancellation. But let's walk through the rest of the steps here in the success case. So if you remember, we need to charge that customer now for an order. Now this Lambda function can invoke um, an API of another service. And then there's gonna be two different possibilities here. We're either gonna have that failure, so you know we failed to charge the customer. In that case, we're going to fill that workflow. And in the success case, we're going to save the state of that charge into our DynamoDB database here. So again, if we get back my pen here, these steps here that I'm drawing a circle around are our third step, which was the charging of the customer. And finally, once we're done with saving that state into our database, we can move on to the next step here, which is to notify that driver to pick up that order and deliver that order to the customer. And similarly, we're gonna wait for a shipping success that can either result in a timeout. It can also result in a success, which in this case would be a shipping completed. And that is a success marker for our workflow. So if we zoom out a little bit here to kind of look at this thing in one shot, sorry, there's a lot of steps here, so it's kind of difficult to work, uh, work through here. Anyway, so this is the workflow that we use to build um, that kind of application that we just saw in that event-driven architecture. So what are the benefits of using this kind of approach? So one benefit is the centralization of the workflow itself. In the previous example, in event-driven architectures, we have this kind of implicit workflow that's connected through other AWS services. In this case, the workflow is very discrete. It is built in a particular application, and it's very, very easy now to also monitor the state of this workflow. Now, we're currently modeling a workflow, but once you create your workflow and you start instantiating instances of it, or in other words, play Placing orders, you're very easily able to track the status and the flow that this workflow takes as it moves through these sequences of steps. So one of the cons that we talked about for the event-driven workflow was it's very hard to monitor the state of an order. Well, in this case, it's very easy. Everything is right in front of you here, and it's very easy to trace back the steps that a particular order went through. Now, another pro is that you get these explicit failure states here. So let me actually zoom in a little bit uh, and kind of tell you what I'm talking about. So because of certain event flows that we took or certain paths that we took in this workflow, we can decide to fail this transaction or fail this order very, very discreetly. And I didn't do it here, but what you can do is in the case of a failure, if kind of we took this path, you can handle these errors explicitly. So maybe you want to have another Lambda function here that gets invoked as a result of failures and that Lambda function would cancel the order that we originally put in the database up here. So failure handling is very, very explicit. So those are some of the pros of using this type of approach. What are some of the cons? Well, some of the cons are in terms of cost. Now we have this kind of third party orchestrator sitting out here behind the scenes that's managing the state of each of these independent steps here. And after each step is performed and completed or failed, step functions need to report back to that orchestrator here the state of that step so it can decide on what it wants to do next. And there is a price for that. Using step functions is not free and it's something you need to take into account when budgeting for your application. Now, another problem with this is that, uh, remember when I was saying in the previous architecture, it's very easy to separate this out into kind of service teams that own each particular component. So a service team owns the placing of the order, a service team owns the packaging, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, since we've created a workflow, that becomes much, much more difficult. Not impossible, but just more difficult because now we need to basically rip out the guts of this explicit workflow and start building it into microservices. So that can cause a little bit of a headache. You're not able to easily refactor this out into separate dedicated teams or services that are able to manage each independent component. So those are some of the cons that you want to be aware of. Now, another term to use this kind of workflow style approach, sometimes you'll hear this in literature or other people just talking about design patterns, is the orchestrator pattern. And it's called the orchestrator or the coordinator because you have a single third party here that is monitoring the state of each of the steps here and telling the application what to do next. So that's why it's called an orchestrator. So there are pros and cons about using these two types of approaches and hopefully it's clear now the difference between these two things. So I hope you enjoyed this video. To learn more about step functions, check out the videos on the left and right, and I'll see you next time.